Welcome to a new series on linguistics, syntax. Uh, this won't necessarily assume any knowledge of syntax in my first course, but it would be good to know a little bit of syntax, so maybe checking out the syntax sections in Introduction to Linguistics would be a good start, but hopefully this series will start from a base where um, even if you're new to syntax, you'll be able to understand this. So let's just jump right into it with an introductory lecture and some information about glossing. Okay, so what is syntax? Well, syntax is the study of how words group together in language. Uh, some people would say syntax is just the study of sentence structure. That's also important, but really one of the key parts is that we deal with words. So if you do morphology, you'll break up words into their part, like simply is simple plus this ly suffix. We don't deal with that, we just treat it as a word and we see how it moves together. Uh, the second big important part about syntax and really linguistics in general, is that we are descriptivists, not prescriptivists. And this means that we observe language and we study how people use it. We don't impose our grammar on people like prescriptivists do. We don't say there is um, certain ways you should talk. We just take a look at a population. We say, hey, look, if everyone in this English speaking population speaks like this, then it's going to be okay. And what do I mean by this? Well, let's take a look at some sentences and ask whether or not they're grammatical. And these are descriptivist grammatical, not prescriptivist grammatical. So the first sentence, we ain't the ones who did that. Now, this is a perfectly fine sentence. We ain't the ones who did that. Uh, the person speaking wants to say, we aren't the people who did that. Uh, ain't isn't really traditional English, but when we hear a native English speaker say it, it doesn't sound terrible. It sounds okay. And for this, it's grammatical. So we just don't put anything beside the sentence. I'll put a check mark here to say, oh, it's grammatical. But usually when we write sentences, if there isn't anything, it's grammatical. Uh, what about the second sentence? Crumple this milk or the lazy potato will fire the camera. Okay, so this doesn't make any sense, but it is grammatical. So uh, the meaning is weird, so we put a hashtag by it but it follows regular sentence patterns crumple this milk well that's like saying verb this noun or some noun will verb some other noun so the sentence structure is good the grammatical structure is good it just doesn't make any sense now let's compare this to sentence three where i do go this is bad we put an asterisk by it to signal that it's bad it's grammatically bad because this I should actually be in this position between do and go. So it should be where do I go, not where I do go. So this is a word order difference and this is ungrammatical. Okay, we'll see more examples of ungrammatical sentences as we go on, uh, but what I really want you to know about whether or not it's grammatical, um, first of all, only native speakers of some language are really okay to give grammatical judgments. This is kind of controversial. When we say native English, we mean you've been using it regularly since about the age of six. Uh, and if a native English speaker says, hey, yeah, that sounds okay, then we'll usually say it's okay. There is some cases where people argue about whether a sentence is grammatical or not. And for those sentences, we put a question mark. And that's when some people say it's okay, some people say it's bad. If we cover some uh, material with Korean reflexives later, maybe we'll see some of that because those can be kind of interesting. Um, but for now, let's take a look at how we do syntax in other languages. Okay, so it's not all just English. Every language has its own syntax, and anyone can study any language's syntax. So to do this, we have three lines in our syntax, and all of our syntactic examples. So for instance, we can call this one one, and there are three lines to example one. First is the literal sentence. So this is French. I cannot pronounce French, so I won't bother. Uh, the second line is the gloss, and this is the important part. So in a gloss, the words are always lined up to their meaning. So je is I. Ne, well, ne is just a negative marker, okay? Mange is eat. And then as we go on, we can see that um, jamais, I think it's jamais, is never, de, of, and then we have meat. So 
Uh, the question is, well, what does the sentence mean? Well, the third line is the translation. So this means I never eat meat. But if we take a look at French word order, the sentence would say I, negative marker, eat never of meat. So we can see there's a bit of a word order difference. For example, eat comes before never. Okay, um, we say of meat instead of just meat. So we have this of marker. Okay, uh, so these are some differences we can see in French. And in order to study uh, these other um, syntactic structures in other languages, we really at this stage hope that somebody else has translated them for us. Um, but if you do speak that other language, then uh, you're very useful because you can translate some of these sentences and give them glosses so other syntacticians can work on these things. Uh, in this course and all linguistics courses you take at a university, you'll always be given the gloss for some other language. Okay, uh, but it's also useful if you're just looking at a language you know. So here's the students asked for these books. Okay, so why would we need a gloss for English? Well, we can break it up into morphemes and be more specific. So the, the is a definite article. Other languages have definite articles. And if we use def.art for all definite articles across all language, then we have this common language that we can understand. So don't think of the as the, think of the as being a definite article. We'll get into, we'll get into these terms a little bit more later. Um, but for now, definite article would be the, an indefinite article would be something like a, or an. So those are indefinite. Okay, take a look at the second word, students. Well, student is a word on its own. And what is this S? Well, students, that S morpheme is really just a plural marker. So we can denote that by saying student dash plural. And this dash plural means that the morpheme is a plural morpheme. Okay, compare this to the dot in the definite article. Now, this means that the dot, that the article is, you know, part of the word. Um, maybe looking at these as well so for dem plural, so a demonstrative, a plural demonstrative. It's not a morpheme that is a demonstrative and then a morpheme that is a plural coming together. It's just one word. Uh, so let's go back to asked. Well, this ed, this is the past suffix. So again, we have this dash here to indicate it's a morpheme. And then in books, I did not put the morpheme marker there, but this would be book with a dash S because this S is also the plural marker. And the sentence is just the students asked for these books. But it's a nice way that we can kind of break things up and we can see uh, the different morpheme structure in different languages, uh, the different properties attached to words in languages, such as agreement, which we'll cover in future videos, uh, plurality, maybe in some languages plurality is built into the words and it's not a morpheme. Okay, so that's grammatical information in gloss. So let's take a look at some of the basic variations we can get. And these are really basic variations. Enough that I think even without any syntactic background, uh, you can get something out of this. Okay, so in English, we could say something like the beautiful waterfall, where we have an adjective coming right before the noun and the adjective here modifies the noun. So the waterfall is beautiful. Now in Spanish, we, they don't say the beautiful waterfall. Instead, they say the waterfall beautiful. And it has the same meaning. So we have an adjective modifying a noun, but the adjective comes after the noun. So these are one of these differences we see across languages. As something as simple as having adjectives come before nouns instead of after nouns, or adjectives coming after nouns instead of before nouns. Okay, so these are some of the things we'll note as we go through take a look at different languages, take a look at different properties of languages, um, and we'll see even more extreme variations, such as the difference between English and Japanese. So English has subject, verb, object, word order. So in Tim ate meat, Tim is the subject of the sentence, that is what or who the sentence is about. Um, ate is our verb, it's our action word here. And then meat is the object of the sentence. So um, what is the subject doing to something if there is an object? We'll cover subjects, objects in detail in the future as well. Okay, 
But Japanese is not SVO. It is an SOV language, which means that the verb comes at the end of the sentence. The subject is first, and the object is second. So instead of Tim ate meat, it would be Tim meat ate. Okay, so these are one of the variations. Um, there is six total different types of languages. So this is SVO, SOV. There is also VOS, VSO, OSV, and OVS. Um, you'll encounter these with different frequencies. So SVO and SOV languages are definitely the most common in the world. And then it slowly bleeds down into this list. Okay. Uh, so here's an exercise just to kind of get, you know, you've, you've watched the introduction. Um, you've learned a little bit about glossing. So given this sentence you've never seen before, what can we pull out of this sentence or this language Icelandic? And we can say what's different from English. Okay, so there is man in garden dot the. Okay, what's, what's the first major thing here? I say dot the here, but really I could write dot definite article. And what does this dot mean? Well, this dot means that the definite article, so this the here, is actually built into the word gardenum. Okay, so that's different. It's not a morpheme, it's just built into this word. So this word for garden is the definite garden. So that is always the garden. If we wanted to say a garden, it would be a completely different word. Okay, uh, another thing to note here is that we have there is man in garden.dev art, but there's no indefinite article here. So there's no word for a that comes before man. So one of the things in Icelandic is that if we want to specify an indefinite article like a man, an apple, we just don't include the article at all. We only include the article as part of a word if it is the definite article. Okay, but for the rest of it, word order seems the same. So there is man in the garden. Um, you know, the, the language and words are different, obviously, but it looks like one of the main differences here is that uh, articles in Icelandic are much different than they are in English. So just with one sentence and 10 minutes of a video, you can already look at another language and you can identify some things that are different in English and you can be a little bit specific about it. Uh, so really the key thing here in this video is, well, how do we do syntax in other languages? And we just use a gloss and we use our syntactic knowledge, our morphological knowledge, and then we can come to some conclusions. But we really want to be much more precise about what we're talking about. Uh, not everything is easy just saying, oh, there's articles, uh, there's word order differences, there's differences where adjectives or prepositions come in sentences. Um, we really want to dive into syntactic theory, talk about groupings of words, talk about properties of nouns, verbs, adjectives, so on and so forth. So we'll get to that in future videos. Uh, so, you know, hang in there. They're coming soon. Uh, if you have any questions about the basics, please leave them in the comments down below, and I'll answer them the best that I can.